We can learn to be okay with discomfort, right? Increase our distress tolerance rather than, um, than just turning to things to soothe us. And I think one way to do this is to learn this ourselves as adults and model this for the kids, right? If we can, if we can model distress tolerance instead of just, you know, when we're bored going to our phones or, or whatever, that's a great way to uh, model, uh, model this for our children. And just like social contagion can spread anxiety from one person to another, we can also spread ease, confidence, joy, curiosity from one person to another. There's actually a whole lot that's known about this ancient learning system, you know, this trigger behavior reward. I think of these as habit loops. Any of us can map these out. Any of us can start exploring, what am I getting from this behavior? What's that result? And any of us can start exploring, you know, what are those bigger, better offers that are out there? My two favorite flavors of bigger, better offers are curiosity and kindness. Now, how does that actually work in terms of changing behavior? You know, I think of it as uh, instead of avoiding things or substituting behaviors, driving this wedge of awareness in so that we can respond with awareness rather than habitually react. Now, does this actually work? You know, you're thinking, well, pay, paying attention, how does this help me change behavior? So we took one of the hardest addictions to work with, which is smoking, and we did a randomized controlled trial with people who are trying to quit smoke. As folks go through our program, we have them pay attention as they smoke, and they start to realize that smoking actually tastes pretty crappy. And I highlight this because reward-based learning isn't based on a behavior. You know, if we wanted to change a behavior and all we had to do was focus on the behavior, my patients would come into my office and I would say, just stop smoking. You know, just stop overeating. Just stop worrying. Our brains work based on how rewarding a behavior is. So if we can help people pay attention to how rewarding something is, then we have a possibility of actually changing that. Your example about smoking is a little easier for me to grasp because if you focus on it, you can, you can establish some pretty negative values to what maybe was perceived as a reward before. Yes. But when it comes to, you know, Rocky Road ice cream, <laughs> that value seems pretty good at first. This can go for chocolate, Rocky Road ice cream, uh, social media, right? Some social media might be fine. But if we're constantly scrolling and we're spending our whole afternoon doing that and not getting our work done, you know, not so helpful. So I think of this as a pleasure plateau. And I, one thing I do with my patients is I have them ask themselves as they're eating, is this bite better than the last, right? So they can really map that out. How about this one? How about, and once they hit that plateau, then they can ask themselves, okay, let me see what it's like to stop eating here versus continue eating. So their brains can really clearly map that out. We actually do know a whole lot about how the mind works. Going back to positive and negative reinforcement. And if we can target those mechanisms, we can actually see robust changes in behavior, whether it's smoking or overeating or anxiety. So how does this actually work? Um, I'm just going to walk you through what, what I've started to see is these three steps of habit change. And over the last decade or so, seeing this so consistently, this is actually what prompted me to write this new book, Unwinding Anxiety, that talks about you know, how we can overcome anxiety, but also other habits through a very simple three-step process. So the first step is becoming aware of being caught up in a habit loop. The second step is exploring the results of the behavior. We'll go into each of these uh, in detail. The third step is bringing in what I call the BBO, the bigger, better offer that helps us step out of these old habit loops and into something that might be a little healthier. Maybe we can actually tap into something that's intrinsic, that's always available, that's not just brief relief, but actually gives us sustained relief. And here, if we look at mindfulness itself, at that quality of curiosity, I love this quote from Lewis Carroll, you know, Alice says, curiouser and curiouser, maybe curiosity itself could be that bigger, better offer. So for example, if you think of your own experience, what feels better, anxiety or curiosity? To our brains, generally, it's a no-brainer. And if you look at, look at this mechanistically, this, we could substitute our old behaviors of stress eating or worrying or whatever with curiosity. Hmm, what's, what's this like? Hmm, am I actually getting something uh, from, from the worry? And when we tap into our direct experience in those moments, we can actually tap into that bigger, better offer of what curiosity itself feels like. 